Thanks for the introduction. So the, the title of my talk is a little bit of a, a, a misnomer for, for what I'm actually going to talk about. So um, I was asked, does this work? Yeah. Um, as, as you've all seen, I was given these two questions and asked to address the two questions uh, that Tim ha just uh, put up. These two questions are, uh, what difference would it make to you if analysts had a clear path along which they could develop their careers? And in your own context, what is the current balance between organization and individual needs when considering analytical delivery? And I'm used to giving talks where I have you know, a bunch of research projects and I stand up in front of the room and I talk about my research. Uh, I'm not used to talking about career paths or uh, empathy or um, the uh, con sort of the balance between individual and organization needs. So, so this talk was a little bit of a challenge for me to put together. Um, so what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about myself and my own not so clear path. Uh, and what I see as emerging differences between academia and industry, which, which make the path for others unclear. Um, and then I thought I'd spend a little bit of time answering the actual questions that, that Tim asked me to answer. Um, so about me, um, I started my career working in, in this building. I, I inherited uh, a, a bookshop on the seventh like right about there uh, in the Flatiron Building in New York City. So, so for the first uh, five years or so of my professional life, I sold old dictionaries and encyclopedias to people. Um, and I got a little tired of that um, and went back to graduate school and uh, studied urban planning. Um, I'm now a professor of geography uh, in Boulder, Colorado, uh, where I direct something called the National Science Foundation Census Research Network. In particular, I direct a piece of that network that focuses on spatial science. My research looks at social space and the intersection of sort of mapping GIS, demography, and statistics. Um, and I also work for a very large tech company in Silicon Valley, sort of in addition to the academic work. So I have both private and public sector experience. I've done this kind of work on, in very different contexts. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I became an analyst is uh, the first job I had after selling the bookstore to some sucker. Um, I, <laughs> I uh, worked with a community group in Harlem on uh, childhood asthma. So the, I went to Columbia University, and the neighborhood just north of there had about a 30% childhood asthma rate. And I was working with a community-based organization on something called the Harlem Children's Own Asthma Initiative. And um, the conditions that people lived in in this neighborhood were pretty shocking. This is somebody who you know, didn't have a working kitchen in her house and is preparing food uh, in the bathtub. Um, this is a kid who has pretty severe asthma and, and it's made much worse by the fact that uh, there's water damage uh, in the ceiling and mold. And so the Harlem Children's Own Asthma Initiative hired contractors and hired people to go around and actually address these things and fix these things uh, for people who couldn't do it on their own. And we got data out of this thing. Um, we found that at, at the beginning of this program, about 25% of the kids in the neighborhood that we were working in had, had missed school because of asthma within the last two weeks. Right? So a quarter of children are missing school regularly because of asthma. Um, for those families that were enrolled in the program, after about a year, that number was down to around 7%. And the question that we were asked, that I was asked by funders was, well, did this program work? And I said, well, yeah, of course it worked. Like, look, it goes down. Um, but they wanted something more rigorous than me sort of saying it goes down. Um, and that was the first time in my life where I had to sort of engage with, with data analysis and statistics. And working with a biostatistician, uh, you know, we came up with this number, which was great. Uh, and it showed that the program was worked and was impactful and it was funded and scaled up and in the newspaper and it, it was great. It was good for me. Um, and it also made me want to go get a PhD, which, which is what I actually did soon after this. Um, in Colorado, I run, some, I run this, this research network, which is a center that's focused on improving uh, the sort of the quality and the usability of national statistics in the United States. In particular, we focus on those statistics that get mapped, so statistics that describe places. Um, 
And the main program that we work on in Colorado is something called the American Community Survey, which is the primary source for demographic and economic data about the US. Um, it's an interesting kind of program. We used to have a census that was done once every 10 years. Um, and in 2010, we stopped doing that. And we started doing this thing called the, we still do a census, but it just counts the number of people in a place. Uh, if you want to know anything about education or earnings or any economic or demographic data, you have to use the ACS. Um, and the ACS is interesting because it's what's called a rolling survey. So rather than measuring everybody on one day and mailing out a survey, the ACS is constantly measuring the American population. Um, it looks at about three and a half million housing units per year, and that, that number rotates. And it's used to allocate an enormous amount of money, 400 to $500 billion in federal spending per year. So, so these are, this is data that has a really big impact on uh, people's lives and infrastructure. And when you look at it, it looks exactly like, more or less like the stuff I was looking at uh, in the Harlem's Children's Zone, right? Here's a bar chart. Instead of just going down, this one goes up and down. Um, so this is the, the city where I live, Boulder, Colorado which, uh, and, and here we're looking at childhood poverty. So this is the number of children under six in poverty in Boulder, Colorado. Boulder is a city of about 100,000 people uh, and it's very affluent. So children in poverty, not, there aren't a lot of them. But if we look at this data, it tells us that between 2011 and 2012, there was a dramatic drop in childhood poverty. However, if we look at the margins of error, on that data, if I use those statistical tools that I had to learn in order to get more money for the Harlem Children's Zone, we see that in fact, there's really no change at all over time, right? The margins of, this, these red bars represent the margins of error on these, these counts of children in poverty. And in fact, really statistically, these, there's not a lot of information here, right? There's not any real change that we can detect when we look at these margins of error. And this is not an outlier, right? So here we're looking at the same kind of, this is the percentage of children who are not in poverty. This is, these are neighborhoods in Chicago. And here we have 0% of children in poverty. And here we have 100% of children in poverty. And the ACS, for all of its millions and millions of dollars, uh, tells us that in most neighborhoods in Chicago, somewhere between 0 and 100% of children are not in poverty, which is maybe not all that, that useful. Um, here we're looking at the same data for LA. Uh, number of children in poverty, and it tells us that, you know, in this particular census tract, which is like a neighborhood, there are 92 kids in poverty, plus or minus 142. 99 plus or minus 115. 61 plus or minus 174. So we have this, this very expensive, very large national statistical program that's for socially meaningful variables is just not giving us a lot of information. Um, just to show you that these aren't, this isn't an isolated case, here we're looking at every neighborhood in the United States. This is that same variable, the number of children under six in poverty. On the x-axis here we have the estimate, so from low poverty up to high poverty. And on the y-axis we have the margin of error. This red line is where the margin of error equals 100% of the estimate. So any dot above this red line means you have a neighborhood like the thing in LA where you, there are 90 kids in poverty plus or minus 100, right? And it's essentially useless information, right? It tells you somewhere between zero and 200 children in that neighborhood are in poverty. Um, so about 45% of all neighborhoods in the United States, the estimate for the number of children in poverty, the margin of error is greater than the estimate in 49%. In, in, a 40, in 45%, in 49% of all neighborhoods in the United States, the margin of error is 50% or more, or is, is between 50 and 100% of the estimate, right? So in all of these places, if you wanted to use this socially meaningful variable to do something, it's very hard, right? We produce data that's just very difficult to use. We talk to people, uh, and if you, you saw my talk in Liverpool today, there's a little bit of, yesterday, there's a little bit of overlap, but it'll end soon. Uh, we talked to people and we asked them, uh, we did a survey of, of local governments in the United States and we asked them what they do when they get information like I just showed you, where the margin of error is bigger than the estimate. And they say things like, I run for the hills, I cry, uh, 
They also say things like, well, I just don't look at the margin of error because it makes things a lot more complicated. Um, my customers, right, so the people I report to, the, the councilman or the mayor or whoever, they're not going to understand the margin of error, so I just ignore it. So this means that a lot of decision making and a lot of, a lot of sort of allocation is being done on data in a way that just doesn't make any sense. And even worse is that a lot of, this last quote speaks to the fact that a lot of federal programs in the United States use the ACS to determine eligibility, um, but the eligibility rules focus only on the point estimate, not the margin of error. So this person says, in some cases, you just have to report the estimate. The end user may be using it for a grant application or a funding program that requires the estimate without any consideration of the margin of error. And here's an example of that. This is a program that invests in financial institutions in neighborhoods where 30% uh, of the population or more lives in poverty. And if you look at the poverty statistics for the United States using the same kind of visualization that we used before, where anything above here, the margin, the actual, the margin of error is greater than the poverty estimate. Anything in between the red and yellow line, the margin of error is 50% of the estimate and so on. So the data that is being used to allocate actually literally billions of dollars over the last decade through that financial institutions program is so fuzzy <laughs> that it's very hard to determine if a place is eligible or not. So a place might have a 25% poverty rate plus or minus 10% and not be eligible for this program. And similarly, a place might have a 35% poverty rate, plus or minus 10%, and be eligible for this program. And you really, you know, some people are not getting support that they might need, and others are maybe getting support that they don't need. Um, the story gets a little better if we look at uh, median household income for the United States, which is a, a a, 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 re, a sort of the bread and butter variable for social scientists working in the U.S. Um, so for median household income, the U.S., the, the, the estimates, the margins of error are generally lower, but they're not all that low. They're still pretty big relative to the estimate. Um, and one of the shocking things about looking at, so here we're looking at median household income in the United States. The blue are places with sort of good data for median household income, and the red are places with bad data. And one of the really striking things about, when I say good and bad, I mean the margins of, the, the size of the margin of error relative to the estimate. This is actually the coefficient of variation, if you notice that. So here, blue are places where we have uh, a relatively low coefficient of variation, so high quality data next to high quality data, and red are clusters of low quality data. And it's very clear that you know, the Northeast and the Midwest has decent data, and the southern parts of the United States have pretty bad data. But if you zoom in and look at the city of Chicago, for example, one of the things you can't see in that national level map is inner cities generally have worse data than the surrounding areas. And these are the places where, like, that need to be eligible for those federal programs. And what it means, when I say worse, it means that this data is just very noisy. It bounces around a lot, right? So you don't really know if the numbers are, are real in the sense that sort of, you know, when you ignore that margin of error column and just look at them, they might not be telling you what, what you think they're telling you. So why is this data so bad? Um, Part of it is just funding. The, the, the number of people that are used to produce these neighborhood level estimates has changed. It's gone down quite a lot. So uh, for the 2000 decennial census, this is the last time the, this once a decade program collected demographic and economic data. That program had about 250 people per neighborhood or estimates were based on about 250 completed surveys per neighborhood. And the ACS is based on about 123. So, so literally half the size. And that's just money at work, right? That's just not having enough money to field enough surveys to get enough responses to make the margin of error small enough for the data to, to use. Um, and so what happens when you have numbers this low is that the weights that you assign to surveys become really impactful. So if you've ever done survey work, you get a response from a person and you have to determine sort of what percentage or what share of the population of interest that person represents, you have to assign a weight. And this was in the news, I have jet lag, so I was up at like 
2 a.m. and I stuck this in. Uh, this was literally in the news like this morning uh, about political polls in the United States. Um, and one poll, so typically the New York Times reports the average of a bunch of different polls. But one poll was an outlier and had Donald Trump sort of way ahead of Hillary Clinton. And that was sort of pulling his average up in these average of polls, this was pulling up his average. And it turns out, this is a story about how one 19-year-old black man in Illinois, because he was assigned a survey weight that was about 3,000 times <laughs> everyone else in the survey, because he was a young black man who supported Trump, which is sort of this rare thing, and by whatever calculation they used to come up with the weight, it was wrong. So he's like, a fe this one guy is like affecting the national polling, and it was like a really interesting story, I thought. So it's in the paper today. Uh, so uh, just to sort of wrap this bit up, so traditional sources of demographic data are under pressure, right? They're under pressure because of funding. They're under pressure. A lot of the problems with the variance in the ACS have to do with sort of technical details around estimation of weights, actually, in exactly the same way that that, uh, that, that New York Times story was, was talking about. Um, but they're also under threat politically in the United States. And so this is, this is congressional testimony from a, a, a legislator from Texas, uh, Ted Poe, which is a good kind of Texan name. Um, and he delivered this testimony uh, to uh, a, a committee that oversees these national statistical agencies uh, in 2012 or 13, I forget exactly. So Representative Poe says, I am here to provide voice for the many Americans who have called my office angry that they are forced to provide private information in response to the invasive questions from the American Community Survey. So these are questions like, do you have a flush toilet? How many flush toilets do you have? Is somebody in your house disabled? Do they have a mental illness? Um, and he goes on to say that I am here to suggest that the federal, the federal government, government does not have a compelling interest in asking these questions of citizens. That the survey, that it shouldn't be required by law, that it should be voluntary, that people should not be compelled to answer questions about their income or their ability or disability. Um, that Congress should prohibit the federal government from forcing Americans to provide information such as what time they leave for work in the morning and what time they come home. So there's all of this political pressure that sees these demographic surveys as really invasive, as government overreach. And there have, in fact, been bills to sort of not only make this program voluntary, but also to defund, defund it, which would essentially mean you have no economic data about the US. This particular question that he's picking on about travel time is like a really integral input for every transportation model that's run by every city in the United States because it helps you predict demand. So it seems invasive, but you know, a lot of sort of governance would fall apart without these things. So um, in response to this sort of political pressure, um, the national statistical agencies in the U.S., and also not, not just in the U.S., in, in, in other countries too, are under pressure to find ways of producing data that are less invasive and less costly. So for example, using administrative data to produce estimates, or using social media, or data from businesses, or doing this sort of data fusion stuff, taking lots of different uh, forms of information and making some sort of composite estimate. Um, and census, these national statistical agencies have in the past been like these hearths of innovation. Um, so the US census was one of the first sort of federal agencies to use a computer. This is something called the Hollerith tabulating machine. And this Hollerith's company later went on to become IBM, right? And, and his first customer, and his first big customer was the US Census Bureau in Washington, DC. And what he made was essentially punch cards, right? A, a machine that could, that could, an electronic counter where rather than having somebody write down numbers in a ledger, you could just use these punch cards to count electronically. So now there's this effort by, uh, by statistical agencies to do the same, to find new ways to innovate and new ways to leverage technology. And some of my colleagues in the census uh, sort of research network 
at the University of Michigan were interested in using Twitter and Google Trends to try to predict the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is one of the key indicators that's produced by the US Census Bureau because it has this huge impact on markets, right? When that number gets published, sort of things happen in financial markets. Uh, so here we're looking at the occurrence of the word jobs uh, in the news according to Google Trends, which if you've ever used Google Trends, it's this cool thing where you can type in a phrase and sort of see its occurrence over time. So um, my, my colleagues who were at the University of Michigan were, had sort of built this composite indicator and were trying to back predict uh, the unemployment rates uh, using this and some other things. And uh, it kind of broke in 2011, their, their model. And does anyone know what happened? Like why were all of a sudden jobs were be was being talked about at incredible frequency in the news in 2011, in, in October 2011. Yeah, <laughs> right? Steve Jobs happened to die, right? It has nothing to do with the economy. It's just that the guy's name happened to be Jobs and that broke their model, right? Um, I'll skip this. So I think that in the academic world, uh, we sort of dabble. We're, we're, we're fundamentally still stuck in the hollow earth tabulating machine world. Right? That is, we, we, we depend upon data from national statistical agencies. Many academics, myself included, this, this is an example of it, but I won't really talk about it, sort of try to use these new forms of information from social media, from Google Trends, from the, uh, you know, business data when we can get it, to, to understand the economy and to understand the social landscape in places. But we're only able to really get at the very tip of the iceberg, that is, the kinds of information that are available to us compared to the kinds of information that are available to certain uh, sort of sectors of industry are very, very different. That is, there's this very profound asymmetry in the kinds of information that we have as academics and as people who are training future analysts and that, that, that businesses have. And one of the most striking things when I went to Silicon Valley was, was this sort of asymmetry. So this is data from the Federal Reserve on the percent of all retail sales in the United States that are done online. And it's now almost 10%. 10% of all retail activity in the United States is online. That means shopping, all of these experiences are mediated through the internet and through uh, you know, Google, through Amazon, through businesses that can capture information about people engaging in these, can, 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 can capture this transactional level information, but also everything that led up to the purchase. So Google is great, uh, not that I'm picking on Google, because its terms of service are really clear. Google does a very nice job of, of telling you the kind of information that they capture when you use their service. Not that anybody reads this, but if you did, <laughs> um, so they say we collect information to provide better services to all our users from figuring out basic stuff like which language you speak to more complex things like which ads you'll find useful, um, the people you interact with online, who your friends are. Um, Google knows your name, email address, telephone number, and credit card. Um, they know the services that you use and how you use them. They know the kind of phone you have. They know who you've called, how long you talked to them who you're sending text messages to. They know what you search for. Um, they know where you are. They also uh, collect information not just about where you are, but who's around you, who's in physical proximity to you. And so all of this information is used to, um, well, I'll show you, but to basically sell you ads. But Representative Poe from Texas is worried about, you know, do you have a toilet or not, <laughs> right? Um, and sees that as an intrusion when, in fact, almost every aspect of your life, if you're a user of these services, which many, many people are, but not all, you know, is, is captured and, and, and stored online by these, by these companies or, or stored and used internally by these companies. So I think within the past five to 10 years, there's been uh, these really fundamental shifts in the data economy. That is, massive as massive sections of the real economy shift online, this new data economy has emerged. 
And this new data economy is not characterized by free trade. That is, the, the data that is generated through all of these transactions is incredibly valuable, sensitive, and is really mission critical for the businesses that capture it. That is, it is this, it, this data is core to their business model and, and not likely to be shared because it's such a strategic asset. So Google, for example, uh, had 30, and this is in the US alone, $30 billion in advertising sales last year, which is like a lot. <laughs> um, and and that, that is all predicated on this information about, about essentially they're able to be very effective as a broker for advertising because they know a lot about you and they know what you're shopping for and what you're looking for. Um, and they're also effective because they can, they can sort of demonstrate the, their effectiveness to advertisers. Um, Facebook is a growing player here, um, as are sort of other, you know, um, a bunch of other players. And in fact, when you look at you know, these tech companies in Silicon Valley, they're often, they're often discussed, their value is discussed in terms of how valuable a user is on that platform. So Twitter, which is desperately seeking somebody to buy it these days, um, has a relatively low valuation. That is, a Twitter user is only worth about $45. That is, so, so what you do is you take the market capitalization of the company, divide it by the number of daily active users, and you get a statistic like this. So a Twitter user is worth $45. Whereas a Google user is worth about $325, right? So um, Google has a lot of users and a very, very high market capitalization. Um, and the reason people talk about the value of these big companies in terms of users is because that's what produces the, the, the information that allows them to sell advertising effectively, which is, in fact, their business model. Um, and data from these companies is simply unavailable to people outside of the company. And in fact, it's not just academics and the people doing the training of analysts who don't have access to this information. Increasingly, there's grumbling within Silicon Valley about lack of access to information. So does anyone, TechCrunch is this really funny, it's like the Silicon Valley sort of news thing, which is like a mix of like video game reviews and like news about like, you know, the latest sort of funding rounds for startups, and it's very, it's a weird news source. Anyway, uh, you know, there was, there was just an editorial in TechCrunch about the fact that startups no longer have access to uh, information on these big platforms like Facebook uh, and Twitter. That is, the, 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 the data that they had previously been able to use to build apps that, that they could then try to monetize is now unavailable because it's seen as such a strategic asset, it's, it's being sort of locked down. And it's not just not available to researchers or people who do training, but it's also unavailable to sort of app developers and people sort of in that world. So I figured I was going to be about out of time now. I don't know how I'm doing on time. OK. Um, I thought I would transition to just sort of talking about the questions that I was asked to answer. Um, because I don't really know what else to say other than what I've said about this asymmetry in the kinds of information that, that's available. That is, these national statistical programs are under both political pressure and financial pressure, and the quality of the data, at least in the United States, is degrading, and there's this very profound asymmetry in the kinds of information that are available between industry and academia. So I was asked to answer, what difference would it make to you if analysts had clear paths along which they could develop their careers, and in your own context, what is the difference between organization and individual needs when considering analytical delivery? So I think it's hard to talk about clear paths for analysts when the, at a very high level, at the sort of 10,000 foot level, when the ground is changing. That is, when there are fundamental changes to the data economy, you know, these, these present challenges for training. We cannot, in a classroom, uh, as academics say, oh, here's what a career looks like in data science, or here's what a career looks like in statistics, because I don't think anybody in this room really actually knows 10 years out or five years out what it's going to look like in terms of what you actually do, what kinds of information you use, and what tools you use. Um, I, don't, I think we can't train students to think critically um, or sort of teach them how to work with customer level data because academics seldom have access to it because it's a strategic resource. So, um, in a grand sense, career paths for analysts are unclear because the data economy is being up upended. But in a very tactical sense, as a manager, for example, 
you know, as somebody who, who has managed teams of analysts in the past, I think you can, as a manager, answer questions about career progression. And you can sort of, at a, as somebody who's working with analysts, um, I think help people provide, understand career progression, and uh, even though there are these sort of macro changes happening. So I think as students, um, analysts sort of have to learn how to look beyond the methods. Students and early career analysts are very interested in tools and sort of how, what tool you use and how you use it and sexy tools or sort of new tools, whether it's a deep neural net or a, you know, um, whatever it is. Um, I think as, as, as early hire sort of transition into mid-career roles within industry, it's important to train people to ask the right question, that is ask questions that are impactful for your business. That is, rather than just taking data and doing some model, because that's what you know how to do, make sure that the thing that you're working on has a clear business case and a clear product at the end of the, the road. And then I think as you move sort of from, you know, move through mid-career towards sort of uh, senior career, and as somebody who tries to mentor people through this, I think it's about widening context. It's about that, that the analysis that you've done provides fundamental insight into business processes. And for an analyst to sort of move on to more senior roles, it's really about how you use those insights that you've gathered to grow within an organization. So I think in a very tactical managerial sense, you can provide a sense of career progression, even amidst all of these sort of big scale changes. Um, the second question that I was asked to answer was about individual versus organization needs. Um, and I think, again, this is the, the, a kind of question that as a manager, uh, I, I would approach by sort of working with my, my, my staff. Um, that is, I think it's important to set individual goals with people um, and to make sure that through their daily work, they're able to achieve their own individual goals, uh, but also that in so doing, they're sort of advancing some business objective. Um, I think one way to do that is to allow room for exploration and innovation within the job. That is to say, hey, you know, you know what, you know, you work, you work on this problem every day, you work with this data every day, you know what works, you know what doesn't work. You know, if there is a way to do this better, do it, right? It may cost us something in the short term, but in the long term, it'll sort of improve our internal processes or improve our product. Uh, and people have the satisfaction of sort of creating something new and innovative and stretching their skills instead of feeling like they're on a hamster wheel and just doing the same thing every day over and over and over and over again, which I think makes people burn out and go insane and leave. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the, that's sort of my answer to these questions in, in that in, that in a on-the-ground sense, these are managerial questions. So to wrap up, um, I think that the quality of public demographic data in the United States has changed in a pretty profound ways, that uh, data production programs in the United States are under pressure, both financial and political pressure, uh, and they're under pressure to sort of evolve and get, become more modern, but they just don't have access to modern information. Uh, they get drips and drabs. Um, that there's this divergence between industry and academia in terms of the kinds of information resources that are available. Um, <clears throat> I think one could ask the question if the, the forms of data that, that say, Google has uh, make national statistical programs irrelevant to industry. That is, why do you need to know the average income in a neighborhood if you actually know everything about the people who live in that neighborhood. <laughs> um, and I think, I think you know, these, these programs may become increasingly irrelevant as that asymmetry becomes more profound. Um, and again, this asymmetry makes training difficult and career paths uncertain. Um, all my work on the ACS, a, a lot of the work that I've presented here is the result of collaborations with lots and lots of people, and the, the papers are, are all here. Um, these are papers funded by my, the center, and uh, I think that's where I'll stop. I'll stop with a picture of uh, Boulder, Colorado. This is the city park across from the university, so it's a pretty place where I live. Great. Thanks.
And I think Tim had some scheme for gathering I questions. First, first, I was just going to see if anybody's got any questions for Seth. Uh, potentially access to things like uh, those that kind of information, which would, for example, fill in a lot of gaps around income. Um, I, very few people do. I I I have applied for access. Uh, I have been granted access, but then denied access, and then granted access, and then denied access. Um, so that information is available in what are called secure data centers. Um, I'm building one of them in Colorado, but there are a very there are a handful of them throughout the country. Um, and getting access is very difficult. It requires that you swear an oath, which is that if you ever leak information, if you ever browse indiv browse for individual records or leak information, it is an automatic two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine and five years in jail. Um, when I said no thank you, they said, well, we've never actually prosecuted anyone, so it's okay. <laughs> so it is, it is available, but under uh, very, very restricted, in very restricted environments. You, can bring no, you can't bring a phone, a paper, or pencil. There's no internet in these rooms, so if you write code, you have to do it from your head. You can't you know, look up functions and things. So it's, it's a very limited environment, but it is, it is available. But maybe that's the price, I mean, that sounds excessive, but maybe that's the price you have to pay in order as academics to have yeah. access to that kind of information. And I think will be quite similar to those in the UK, at sort of Titchfield and ONS in yeah. terms of access to data there. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 I, th I think it's not unusual. I don't think it solves the training problem because access is so restricted, but I do think it, it, it is. And in fact, there's a very large call out now from the, from the Census Bureau about using these, these administrative records like, like Texas to, to improve this stuff. And that's a very active area of research. Yeah. So Seth, just building on, on that question, uh, are you seeing much of an acceleration of an open data program in the US to try and bring into your space out of government data sets, um, information which you can then work on and build into uh, those, those critical uh, sources like ACS. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, many governments do have open data programs. Um, but the kinds of information that you get out of the sort of local open data programs are not necessarily demographic or, or economic. So, so they help you do certain kinds of things, but uh, not others. And so. Uh, but they're, they're, they're there, and I think they're, they're, it's important to think about how they, how they can be used. Um, so property records uh, being an, a really important information asset that, is, that are increasingly available in the U.S. Yeah. Hi. But not where you're from. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Andrew Wright. Um, so, just to follow up on that question, uh, are there is there much headway being made in getting, say, technology companies like like the Googles of the world to share some of their data? Because to, to use your example of say transport demand, Google must have an awful lot of data about that from Google Maps and Waze mm -hmm. and things like that, uh, and there must be lots of other examples, you know, from them looking at search history and shopping information, all, all sorts of stuff that, that, that could be very valuable to academics and, and industry and government if, if they would only hand it over. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, I don't see that happening. In my own experience, has been that um, pretty intense intellectual property negotiations between the university and the, the company that I w uh, worked with or continue to work with there. Um, and that that information is seen as a, uh, in a really important business asset that, you know, that value wouldn't, you don't want to sort of give away that value. But also something that's a risk in that um, 
you know, the, these, these business models really depend upon the ability to collect data. Services like Google Maps really depend upon the ability to collect data and using that to sort of improve the map and find anomalies and things like that. And if, if there's, I think, a deep concern uh, that if that information got out and if people realized what was actually out there, that they might be less willing to use the, those services or le less willing to sort of share the information in that way. And that there's this sort of nagging thing <laughs> out there that, that I think prevents uh, that risk, even if it's small, sort of prevents, I think, this information from getting out. So I have one other question. It, it does, what you articulate in terms of things being becoming even more uncertain, for me, is one of the fascinations about being an analyst. It's how do you deal with things when, when things are so uncertain? But what I've learned is that most people often come to data because they want to try and find some certainty. Whereas when you look at data properly, you actually realize things are way more uncertain yeah. than you think. But somebody's still in the position where they've got to make a decision and they've still got to allocate that 500 billion yeah. pounds of money or, or a company has. How, how do you help people make decisions when you're also mm -hmm. showing them how, quite how uncertain yeah. things are? Yeah, if I had done this sort of standard research regurgitation, uh, it would have very much been on these, the, these questions. So uh, I think, you know, we, one answer is to try to build statistical or computational tools that actually reduce the uncertainty. Uh, and that's something that we work on. Um, we've also done research on how people reason with uncertain data. And it's actually pretty, it's pretty, which we haven't published yet, which is pretty interesting. You know, local knowledge sort of wins out, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you show people a, a map and ask them to, or ask someone to complete a task with uncertain data, if it's in an area that they know, they'll just say, well, I don't trust that data because it's, it's bad. So, so local knowledge can sort of substitute for data quality in certain situations. If we ask people to complete the same task in a randomized experiment for an area that they don't know, they rely very much on the information and, and, and tend to ignore the, the uncertainty. So you know, having on the ground knowledge of the situation it becomes very important uh, for dealing with that uncertain data. Mm. Martin. I, I was struck by the map you showed of, Sh of Chicago, uh, and it just rec occurred to me that if you are fairly certain about the uncertainty within the data, is there any way in which you can use that? In other words, that the presence of uncertainty has to mean something. Yeah. And is, yeah. is, is there any use in that? Yeah. Is there any meaning in that? Yeah. So we've tried very hard, and one of the papers in that list, which was written with uh, Danny Arribas Bell, who's in the audience here, uh, we've tried very hard to, to try to sort of decompose that uncertainty and to understand what's causing it. One potential cause is, is just heterogeneity within neighborhoods. That is, maybe certain neighborhoods are more diverse, and because you have a more diverse population, you sort of your variance is higher in your estimate. Uh, well, another possible ex explanation has to do with response mode and waiting and how sort of in certain neighborhoods, the way the ACS works, if you don't respond to the mail survey, you get bumped to its telephone and then you get bumped to an in-person interview. And in-person interviews receive very high weights. And so if you have a weird mix of response modes, you get variance in the weights, which creates variance in the estimate. Um, but ultimately, we don't have a great answer for what kinds of places we found some patterns. But I don't think we know exactly what is causing the uncertainty. Um, we have tried to build sort of uh, geodemographic classifications, which we think actually reduce that uncertainty. If you think of uncertainty as random error, and you have a lot of different variables with random error, by sort of putting a lot of them together, uh, the individual variables are noisy, but those random errors should sort of cancel each other out. So if you think about a multivariate classification, maybe you can get a, a, a typology of a neighborhood without actually getting a precise point estimate for income. And so that's another strategy that we've used to, to look at, at these data. Thank you. Yeah. Brilliant.
Seth, first I'd like to thank you for actually grasping the nettle of what I actually asked you to do, which was unusual, okay. and, and take on. So yeah. I, I really appreciate you uh, sure. driving that, that route. And now I want to pass the baton back to everybody else. As I say, I want to use the opportunity that you're in the room to try and capture some of the issues. So, yeah. so I, first, I first want you to think, you'll, you'll find on each of your tables there's, a, there's already a piece of... Uh, uh, flip chart paper. It's at the moment it's rolled up, and there's the the inevitable uh, post-it notes. And I want to pose you with three three questions, really, for you to think about. And we've got about 50 minutes to do this. So the first question is: Hopefully, Seth's presentation and, and the stimulus to be people has given you some opportunities. And I want you to particularly focus on your own environment. What particular things it might prompt you to change? within your own circumstances. Some of those things you might choose to do yourself. And then and I have to give uh, Neil credit here. Neil's gonna speak after, after the coffee, just before lunch. Neil suggested two really, what I think are really interesting questions. One is, what's the safe step you can take to try and achieve one of those goals? But then the next one is, what would be, if you, if you took off the shackles and you didn't think about other people's opinions and all the constraints of the organization, what would be the really risky step you might want to take? So I'm gonna give you uh, five, five to seven minutes first to just think about that, then put your post-it notes on the sheet so we can capture it later on, and then we'll have a, a chance to try and capture questions. Now, it's, I accept it's, a, it's an unusual question at this point, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with a bit of silence for a while whilst you, you prompt it. So think first, what sort of thing, as a result of some of the things Seth said, it might be other ideas, would you like to change about your own environment and in order to do analysis better? Okay, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm really keen now to just see, it. They say in behavioral change mode that those who are actually publicly stated are way more likely to do it. So, so now is your chance to actually, I'll ask the microphones to wander around and see if there's any people who are gonna volunteer some things that they'd like to change themselves. There might be the safe steps or, or some of the ones that you, risk, uh, risky steps that you'd like to take. Is there any, any things that anybody wants to volunteer? Out of the back. Hi, Martin Bellingham from AXA PPP. Um, just to start the ball, the ball rolling, um, I think margin of error is always interesting, um, particularly if you're speaking to an audience that struggles to know the answer or understand the answer, let alone complicating it with whether or not the answer is the true answer. Um, so that, that, that's something I want to think about and also think about the chaos so as Martin said about um, sort of looking at some of the interesting bits around the, the data in the centre of Chicago um, and obviously when you're talking to the ONS about the census and they've got a good idea about the problem areas and do you identify them early on to shove in more enumerators and or do you wait for them to be a problem and then shove in the enumerators, in which case the people have probably changed because they're fairly highly mobile. So I think in terms of the, the second question um, is actually look at it from my point of view. So yeah, margin and error, uh, understanding some of that. And probably the brave step is actually then talk about it. Um, <laughs> but I'm probably at stage two and a half at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Over on the left. Uh, James Gooding, um, we, we had a, a kind of broad ranging discussion, but we did try and answer the questions. Thank you. And um, I, I just felt that there's not really that much time to go back and have a bit of appraisal afterwards on a piece of analysis. Um, very often I've made a recommendation and then you forget about it and you move on to something else. Um, now a safe step would be for me to go back and check through those things. There's absolutely no reason why someone from another division couldn't do that for me and be a lot more critical. But that's not 
that's not very kind of comfortable to think about. Thank you. I think the really, sorry, down at the front, I say one, one of the difficult things actually is just making time to do those steps of looking back. It's a brave forecaster who looks actually to see whether their forecast worked. Uh, I'm going to try and paraphrase a few things my colleagues here were saying, but um, those irritating stakeholders we all work for um, all ask us lots of difficult questions around our insights and is that statistically significant and all these sorts of things, which is the point that came up in our discussion here. But how often really do we go back and test the source data that we're working with to get to those analyses? A lot of the time we're working pragmatically, going, oh, that's the best available one. Okay, so we're going to use that postal sector data, which might be a bit ropey, but actually, could we all learn a little bit from the last presentation about doing some more testing on the data that we're using every day so that we can then impart the confidence of the inside the finding? You know, I'm in more than 20 years of doing this, I probably haven't done it enough, put it that way. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure if it's true for me, it's true for most of us in the room. Thank you, Steve. David in the back. Hi, David Reed from Data IQ. So our challenge is understanding who is active in the data and analytics industry. So as it were, a census, uh, rather like Seth trying to achieve a census of um, households in, in the US. Um, we don't know the, the, the universe that we're trying to reach. Um, we try and attract people towards us through our activity. Uh, so a safe step might be everyone who's engaged with us, ask them who else around them is also engaged with this. Um, but a, a bold step might be in some way to achieve recognition of data and analytics as jobs by a specific job code in government statistics. Because as, as I understand it, neither as an industry or, or an employment level, does this work get, get recognized and counted? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we'd like. Thank you. I am conscious that one of the things to never do is make, oh, James. Yeah, hi, it's James. Um, one of the things we talked about was people running away with the data, like you've said, so somebody taking a set of numbers and inferring the truth for them. So one of the things we talked about was really trying to balance up and make sure there was a proper analytical presence in decision making and um, business discussions. Because one, to make sure that they aren't interpreting a trend and not understanding where there might be variance um, and running away with the fact that something's growing when really I think a, a point was it's a 0.5% up that could easily just be a 0.5% down if you looked at the statistical significance and trending. So being the honest broker in the room and not allowing people to interpret the data as they fit for their story. The other piece then is the flip side of making sure the analysts work very closely with business people to know that the reason the shop's figures store sales have declined is because there's roadworks outside it and nobody can get in through the front door, which won't be in your data. So an analyst has to be pragmatic and work with the business, and what we've got to do is push to make sure business people are pragmatic and work with analysts to understand what they're interpreting. Mm. Thank you. It is quarter past 11. I learned never to make people late for coffee and lunch. So coffee is now, and then we'll, we'll reconvene later to hear about the Consumer Data Research Centre. Thank you very much. <laughs>